So before the word geek was a regular part of our lexicon, pretty sure I was one. Now, I'm not a technology geek. I'm a kid geek. I am totally fascinated by them. What makes them tick? How do they think? How do they learn? I mean, just think, a newborn in their first year has mastered language and motor skills and hopefully the art and the promise of relationship making. And for my whole adult life, I have either worked with children or for children. They clearly float my boat, and I've had some pretty interesting jobs. And for about two decades, my life also included making cupcakes at 11 p.m., macaroni and cheese, and carpools. I think you're a sharp group. Yes, I'm also a mom. And as much as I loved all of that, okay, I lie, I never loved the 5 a.m. carpool. But I loved most of it. And then one day, something kind of fun happens, and you're an empty nest. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I missed the day-to-day -day with my kids, but I kind of liked this empty nest thing. You know, I could go home at 6 o'clock and put my jammies on. I could have cheese for dinner. <laughs> Maybe not even have a vegetable. And I could hang out with my husband again. It was pretty fun. But then, you know, there's this life thing, and sometimes it sneaks up on you and just whacks you upside the head. So our particular head whacking came in a later acquisition, an inheritance of sorts, in the form of a six-year-old little boy. A family crisis, and we would become the full-time family for our great nephew. Now, when something like this happens that changes everything about your current life and your plans for the future, well, you adjust. You get help. And for me, I just kept going to work. And thank God for work. Because diving back into full-time parenting again was exhausting. But work? was interesting, it was creative, and I was learning new things about children that was feeding my inner geek. I learned about one study done by the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser, where they looked at how early childhood stressors could predict long-term health outcomes. They called this ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. They created a test with just 10 questions. Believe me, this is not a, a test you want to get a perfect 10 on. Because these questions are related to child abuse and neglect, substance abuse, being chronically belittled by an adult, or not having enough food to eat. So I, I don't think there's a huge debate here. I think we all, even common sense tells us those are, those are bad things for kids. And I knew that. I had even been on a child abuse team at one point. I carried a beeper 24 hours a day. I heard about unspeakable things that happened to children. So I knew this was all bad. But this study brought it to a whole new level of bad. People with an ACEs score of four or more are twice as likely to develop diseases like asthma, heart disease, even cancer, a score of four or more, and you are five times more likely to suffer from depression, and 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. You bump that score up two more just to six, and your life could be shortened by 20 years. So that little boy at our house, he has a score of seven. And I remember sitting at the conference where I first learned about this, and I, I think I actually slumped down in my seat. This research made it so much worse than I thought. And it was completely overwhelming. And worse yet, 
I didn't know what to do with it. And you know what? I hate not knowing what to do. But this was the exact moment when my two worlds would collide. What I was learning about at work was playing out in my living room. I would have a front row seat to see how a high A score could manifest itself, not in 40 years with heart disease, but right now with a living, breathing seventh grader. I got a message at work one day from a teacher that said uh, he had absolutely refused to do an assignment in class, dug his heels in, not going to do it, and would you please talk to him? Oh boy, I, I know teachers really love that kind of behavior. But of course we would talk to him. So that night at dinner, we said, so buddy, what happened to fourth period today? And instantly there was crying, which turned immediately to sobbing. The kind of sobbing where they can't catch their breath and you're pretty sure they're gonna throw up. And this went on for two hours before we even knew what the assignment was which turned out to be, create a timeline of your life. Oh, well, his timeline includes a mother who drank and used drugs prenatally, probably permanently damaging his brain. A mother who was seriously mentally ill, but refused her medications. Plenty of neglect, plenty of yelling, and then, his one saving grace, his grandmother, who was my sister, dies. He has to come and live with us. And then, if that's not enough for this little guy, his mother is murdered when he's eight. How's that for a timeline? So do you think he was gonna do that assignment and put it on the back to school night bulletin board? No, I don't think so. But what appeared to be an absolute act of defiance was really an act of self-preservation. And so you could think, was this the teacher's fault? No, of course not. She didn't know, and she had been doing this assignment for years. But when we talked, she clearly got it, and she wondered aloud if other kids might have felt the same way. I don't know who I felt sorrier for, my nephew or for her. But for me, there was this real moment of clarity. My nephew is not the only child suffering like that. We needed to learn more about ACEs, about trauma-informed care, and about best practices. Because I really believe that knowledge is power. And while pediatricians and therapists are all very important in this effort, let's do the math. Besides their families, who do these kids spend more time with? Their teachers. And teachers are smart and they're creative and they care. Isn't it time we give them the power of this compelling research? Now, teachers might not always have the backstory about a child in their room, but they are clearly in a position to help. And besides, they actually already know so much of this. They just might not know they know it. But every teacher has that one child, or two, or six, whose behavior is puzzling. These are the children who can't seem to keep themselves regulated. They are sometimes angry or defiant or sad, sometimes all in the same moment. And these are the children that teachers worry about. And now there is a mountain of research about this. But luckily, it really comes down to just three things. Cap. K-A-P, knowledge, attitude, and practice. And I want to bring new knowledge to educators so that they have a new lens to view children with. And I want to shift attitudes away from what is wrong with that kid to what happened to them.
And if we can shift attitudes, and if we can impart more knowledge, could we change practice? Just think of that one teacher. What if she changed some of her lesson plans? She probably teaches about 150 kids a year. In 10 years, that's 1,500 kids who would have had a teacher who is sensitive to their histories and deliberate about her lesson planning as not to further traumatize these kids with really high ACE scores. Can you imagine the healing power in that? But what do we do in our day-to-day -day practice? Well, at home, we try to listen to our nephew with more compassion. At school, I make sure they have his backstory. But I really believe that as people who care deeply about children, that we need to bring trauma-informed care to schools so that together we can forge new pathways to hope, calm, and resilience. But you know, we are all teachers, and we're all students. And I wonder if each of you could pivot just a little bit. I challenge you to notice that kind of surly teenager, but this time with a little more kindness. Pay attention to that woman in the grocery store who seems to come unhinged for no reason. Maybe we could all lose that thought. What is wrong with them? Take a deep breath and say, what happened to them? Thank you.